well, it's actually been a bit wet here in Metro Manila. That's where I'm based, so I'm wearing the jacket. And uh, yeah, I think majority of Hope Givers are based in Metro Manila. I'm not sure. Uh, a good number, but yeah, it's been raining a little bit here in the Philippines, in the country, in this capital. But yeah, that's all besides the point. So, welcome once again to Pathways of Hope. My name is Jake Tan, and I'll be giving today's meditation. So, we're actually looking at the Gospel of Luke this time. So, actually, the previous uh, Gospels that were not Sundays, we're actually looking at the Gospel of Matthew, Sermon on the Mount. But today, we're looking at the Gospel of Luke, specifically chapter 1, because it's actually a feast today. The feast is the Feast of the Nativity of John the Baptist. So, I just want to focus on a few key ideas, which actually, for me, like I haven't really been thinking about, even if we, like, look at this feast on a yearly basis. Actually, when I think of this feast, I think of how it's going to be some sort of like celebration or how there's a festival actually going on in San Juan City here in Metro Manila. It's called the Wata Wata Festival. But that's all besides the point again. So looking in at today's gospel, so again, we're looking at the gospel of Luke. This is chapter one. Nat- Nativity, it's uh, the birth of John the Baptist. And I just want to focus on two key ideas that I didn't really think about, as I said a while ago. So, one is the name. So, John. When you look at the Hebrew word John, you know, you, there's so many Johns in our life that you might know. You might know a couple of Johns, not just one. But, yeah, if you uh, stop to think about what the name means, it actually means God is gracious or God has been gracious. And, you know, that's kind of clear with how God has been gracious to give a child to Zechariah and to Elizabeth, right? So I think that's something really important. So it has a lot of to do, it has a lot to allude to, you know, with Abraham and Sarah, right? And, you know, because they're also in their old age yet, they were able to conceive. And this was foretold by the message of an angel, the angel Gabriel to Zechariah when he was um, at the temple. And, even furthermore with the graciousness, so it has something to do with John's title. So we know that he becomes John, or he is John the Baptist. And it talks about how, uh, you know, Jesus highlights in the Gospels how John is such a great man that uh, prior to him, there's no one greater than John. And it talks about God's graciousness. You know, he sustained him in the desert. He baptized many by water to come to repentance and make the way for Jesus himself, for the Savior himself. So it's a reminder of God's graciousness also in our own lives. That uh, even the impossible can happen or even with the minimal amount of means, God can still work in people's lives and through people's lives. So God can still use us. He equips those who are called, just like John the Baptist. So that's the first idea that came to mind. The second has something to do with how he was named. Because you know, if you look at the... The passage for Luke 1, it's the process of how John is named. And it starts off with talking with Elizabeth, asking her or she declaring that his name will be called John. And then the people who were helping him, helping with the delivery, helping her with the delivery, and maybe even the relatives and neighbors were saying, huh, but nobody's been called John. He should be called Zechariah also, just like the father, you know, the lineage. And then they go to Zechariah, and we don't know if Zechariah and Elizabeth had talked about it. In fact, Zechariah at this point was mute. He couldn't talk because, again, the angel caused that to happen to him or you know, made that, uh, imposed that on him when he didn't believe at first. And then he writes saying his name is John. And they are marveled by that now. Wow, maybe they didn't even talk about it. It would have been hard to communicate that. Or maybe at that point. Or maybe they talked about it prior because this is a fruit of the instruction that the angel Gabriel gave them. And for me, as I think about this passage, it's all the more beautiful when at that very moment, uh, Luke places it there that he is no longer mute and he can start to speak. So what does that mean? From someone who was unbelieving at first and punished because of that, so became mute, suddenly the prophecy or that foretelling that message from Gabriel was was fulfilled when John and Elizabeth named their child as instructed by the angel and they were obedient to that. So initially in disbelief, but even with that disbelief, 
uh, they pushed through it all the way to the end and came up with the decision to continue with what the April, what the what the angel Gabriel said they should do, and they did it, and he was relieved of his muteness, and I think that has also something to do with pushing through with the Lord's plan. Like even if we're not 100% cooperative at the beginning, doubtful, if there's a really clear message about, okay, this is what the Lord wants us to do, we should continue with it. No matter how much doubt, no matter, no matter how disobedient we've been, reckless sometimes with going towards that decision, it has that element of commitment at the same time knowing that, okay, if this is really true, then we should stick by it if this is the Lord's message for us. So, in closing, I think it's a great way to just meditate on how has the Lord been speaking to us? Where does He want us to commit to? That despite maybe our sinfulness, our disobedience at times, times when we have shortcomings or we fail, at the end, the Lord still says, uh, we can do it. We can fulfill it to the end. And we can still be in agreement with Him and wondrous things can come about that. And I think the second thing is, where has God been gracious in your life? Where has grace been so abundant or despite how undeserving we've been of it, it's still been so present. It can be in things that we take for granted. It can be in resources that we have that we can use. It can be in the service that we offer. So where is this grace? Where is the graciousness that God is so evident and so present? And how is the Lord using that to transform us more into himself to be people, as Jesus said, that if John the Baptist was so great, but he caused his followers to be greater or do greater things than John the Baptist, that we can do that too. We can, we can emulate him and be keep to the truth of what Jesus said, that we can be great like John and we can continue to bask in that grace that he offers in us. So that's it. That's it for today's meditation. I hope this is something you found helpful. Again, if this is something find meaningful, feel free to share this reflection, feel free to follow the page, and yeah, more to come. So God bless you in this ordinary season that we are in.